Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third talk in our spring research seminar series. My name is Rebecca Tropp. I am the research and events convener here at the Paul Mellon Center. And I'm very happy to introduce um, this evening's speaker, Alex Bremner, who is professor of architectural history at the University of Edinburgh. Alex's research focuses on the history and theory of 19th and early 20th century British architecture, uh, with a special interest in British imperial and colonial architecture. His most recent book is Building Greater Britain, Architecture, Imperialism, and the Edwardian Baroque Revival, circa 1885 to 1920, which was published by Yale University Press in 2022. He is currently completing a new history of Victorian architecture for Oxford University Press, for which he has received a Paul Mellon Center Senior Fellowship. Uh, we will have a Q&A following Alex's talk. For those in the room, you will be able to ask your question directly to Alex. We will have microphones that we will pass around. And for those joining us online, please type your questions in the Q&A box and I will read them out uh, for Alex to, to answer. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Alex Bremner, who will be speaking to us about why Edwardian Baroque architecture matters, empire, identity, and geopolitical rivalry. So please welcome. Uh, Professor Alex Bremner. Thank you uh, very much, Rebecca. And thank you also to the Paul Mellon Center for inviting me here to give this talk uh, this evening. Um, as Rebecca pointed out, my talk this evening relates to my recent book entitled uh, Building Greater Britain, which you can see here, which is really a, a kind of new account of a particular movement in the history of British architecture, now referred to as the Edwardian Baroque. Edwardian because uh, it was seen to reach its height or apogee in the first decade of the 20th century, although, as I explained in the book, it did appear before that and continued after it. And Baroque because many of its stylistic features we associate, or the stylistic features that we do associate with it, um, were Baroque-like in form, uh, referencing in particular the architecture of the great English Baroque masters, as they later became known, of the late 17th and early 18th century, such as Christopher Wren, Nicholas Hawksmore, John Vanbrugh, James Gibbs, and so on. However, um, rather than give a lecture per se on the Edwardian Baroque uh, this evening, uh, where, what it is, where to find it, and so on. I'm instead going to offer a kind of meditation on it, which is based more on the preface to my book uh, than the actual contents of the main text in many ways. As you can see, um, or saw, I essentially ask in the title to this talk, why does Edwardian Brock architecture matter? Indeed, why does it matter? Because for such a long time it didn't. Um, as I go along in this talk, I'll have some slides going in the background just to give you a sense of feel for what this kind of architecture is and looks like. And these are two, two classic examples of it. So what I'll attempt to suggest here is that it matters uh, as a subject of architectural history now, or to put it another way, has come closer to the center of our historical field of vision, not only because of its connection to and the insights it offers on uh, Britain's national and imperial past, but also, and intriguingly, because of the questions it poses regarding contemporary geopolitical circumstances and the echoes that its context contains of the manifold predicaments we find ourselves in today and how architecture responds to them. So let me begin by outlining briefly how I got onto this subject in the first place, because uh, this is relevant really to why it might be seen as salient 
Now, I was attracted to this architecture, this movement, uh, as a locus of study because there was something odd, even mysterious about it, to my mind. In general histories of architecture, it barely ever featured at all. In histories of British architecture, it didn't get much of a mention either. Only in specific histories of Edwardian architecture did it get anything like the attention it uh, deserved. Yet, yeah, walk down certain streets in a city like London, and it's pretty much the only type of architecture that you'll see. Indeed, most British towns and cities had, still have, at least one or several prominent examples of it. So why was it such a, a sort of blank spot in the history of British architecture so long? Well, the Edwardian Brock architecture, so-called, faced two problems in particular in relation to modern architectural historiography. The first of these is that it tended to fall between stools or between the gaps uh, of history in, in a way. And the second um, is that leading historians of the mid-20th century, the likes of Nicholas Pevsner, Harry Goodhart Rendell, and Henry Russell Hitchcock, basically poo-pooed it, at least for a generation, if not more. Now, in the case of the first of these problems, uh, scholars and historians, particularly in the British context, were tending to study either Victorian architecture or modern architecture, therefore largely skipping over the two or so decades between these two major periods and movements. After all, it was pretty clear what Victorian architecture was uh, as it was for modernist architecture. But what was Edwardian architecture? Was there even such a thing? Indeed, and this brings me to the second problem. Hevsner said there was effectively no point studying architecture of the Edwardian period, such as such like this, um, because what applied in the Victorian period simply applied to it. While Goodhart Rendell viewed it as vacuous, the Edwardian Brock, that is, uh, and not worthy of serious study. Although, interestingly, when he mentioned this back in the 1950s, he conceded that perhaps it was too close to his own time for a true perspective, and that perhaps another 50 years or so uh, needed to pass before anything useful or insightful might be said about it. It wasn't until the 1970s, in fact, that this kind of architecture began to be taken seriously by one historian in particular, Alistair Service. The service began to study the Edwardian Baroque on its own terms, uh, indeed showing that it was something different to Victorian architecture, per se, that it had its own registers worthy of uh, consideration. But being the 1970s and largely following the formalist traditions of art historical scholarship in Britain, he didn't have much really to say about the movement's wider social, cultural and political contexts. To his credit, he did acknowledge that perhaps this kind of architecture had something to do with ideas of empire and British imperialism, but stopped short of any kind of uh, analysis of this connection um, in detail. So it wasn't until some time later, indeed around 50 years later, um, uh, uh, since Goodhart Rendell made his initial comment on this, that the wider context and cultural registers of the movement began to be explored. For me, this was the most intriguing and fertile facet of Edwardian Baroque as a species of architecture. And the key in many respects, I would argue, to unlocking its history and meaning. In other words, if it didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to the likes of Pevsner and co, then when properly placed within its cultural and geopolitical contexts, it suddenly makes quite a lot of sense, I think, 
in this respect, it was something of a consciously responsive or reactionary kind of architecture, and one that served as a type of barometer, if you will, on how the British saw themselves and their place in uh, the wider world. Now, the first point uh, to make in relation to this is that the advent of the Edwardian Baroque clearly did not occur in a political vacuum. Indeed, the geopolitical environment was vexed, very vexed. The era of great power rivalry at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries, you know, between the United Kingdom, Germany, Russia, the United States, and later Japan, had put Britain on notice, raising concerns over its authority and competitiveness into the future. This naturally caused a great deal of anxiety or what the historian John Darwin has called a certain fear of falling, which was felt in sectors as, as diverse as finance, politics, the military, and scientific and technical innovation. The anxiety or this anxiety stemmed primarily from the realization that the United Kingdom, once the world's leading industrial power, was no longer on top of the world it had been caught up to and even passed in its ma manufacturing capabilities as well as in its share of global trade. So decline looked inevitable. So governments in both Britain and its colonies considered what options were available in shoring up their position. In other words, what were they to do, both individually and collectively? Formal political unity was one idea that was proffered, so-called imperial federation, but actively promoting closer social, economic, and cultural ties was considered a more sort of realistic and effective means of keeping the British world and its common interests in unison. This anxiety was also behind the rise of the so-called new imperialism, that characterized British politics for some decades, from about the mid 1870s up until uh, the First World War. Now, architecturally, it was the Edwardian Baroque that stepped forward to meet this challenge. This anxiety, this fear, this, um, or these new and, 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 and revitalized imperial horizons provided the nervous energy, as it were, that animated Edwardian Baroque architecture, or at least that's my uh, contention. It is, as you can see here uh, on the screen, a vigorous and powerful, some said manly, type of architecture. And I'll come back to that idea in a moment. An architecture that was determined to project strength or ideas of strength. Now, through this, it created something of an aesthetic bulwark against real and imagined imperial decline. It presented a face, as it were, of muscular engagement that sought palpable reassurance over the solidity and continued sway of British global intervention in all its forms. In this regard, the Edwardian Baroque was both conceived of and promoted as an architecture of empire. It was a style that, that Aston Webb, one, one of its leading proponents, had hoped would be appreciated the world over as, quote, representing this wonderful empire, end quote. Or what Herbert Baker, that imperial ultra, had fancied as, quote, a common imperial style, end quote. But all of this was a kind of illusion, a bluff even. It was connected to a type of identity politics that may have appealed to, indeed shouted about, the glories of Britain's rise to world dominance, now slowly ebbing away, but as I say, was in fact rooted in fear, suspicion, and a certain degree of self-loathing. So the sense of confidence that it projected 
was reactionary and therefore somewhat hollow, I would argue. It was what might be called a form of architectural chest beating as the great and aging guerrilla that was the British Empire faced challenges from upstart rivals all over the world. Now we have to remember, just on that point, we have to remember that this architecture approached its apogee around or during the Second Anglo-Boer War, which lasted from 1899 to 1902. Now, although Britain eventually won this conflict, leading to South African unification uh, in 1910, it was looked at lose for a while, especially early on in the conflict. How was it, many people asked, that basically militia-style bands of what were effectively nothing more than Afrikaans farmers could bring the might and organisational power of the British Army to its knees. All sorts of reasons were given, including the physical de degeneracy of the British male, who for generations had been reeling from the effects of industrialization, poor nutrition and housing, and generally lacking in a healthy constitution. Here came a crisis in British masculinity of John Bull, full of pluck and vigour, as someone who rather turned out to be a wizened and scrawny runt. The mirage of British invincibility was hanging by a thread until the breakthroughs at Maith King and Ladysmith in 1900 witnessed an outpouring of jingoistic fanfare, providing not only military relief on the battlefield abroad, but also a psychological reprieve back here in Britain at home. In many ways, the Boer War was or uh, is what these days we would call a kind of proxy war between great, great, uh, greater powers. In this case, Germany and Great Britain. If larger conflict indeed loomed, the question was, was Britain prepared for it? The spectre of a rising Germany haunted the corridors of power in Britain, with some talking of imminent invasion even. The so-called antagonism between Britain and Germany only served to heighten tension and fear. But the Edwardian Baroque was more than a mere sort of front in the sense that it was seen to embody an essence of Anglo-Britishness. It was an architecture that was understood as signaling a kind of vigour that was sober, measured and sensible, therefore representing a form of sort of controlled assertiveness. As Reginald Blomfield, one of the leading advocates of the movement, once remarked, and he said that, you know, form making, designing of details, planning and buildings were all important for the architect, but, and I quote, architecture itself is something very much greater, something beyond um, all this. Now, these um, were traits. These, some of these things I'm describing to you here about this architecture these were uh, traits, according to some of these advocates of this movement, um, who uh, perfected Renaissance architecture, the likes of Inigo Jones, Christopher Wren, Hawksmoor, Vanbrugh, and so on. These were apparently the true, or were apparently true English gentlemen, patriots, and their architecture was an inflection uh, of this identity and the civilization that it stood for. This was understood as qualitatively different to the architecture and people of other nations and cultures, which were by and large uh, perceived as either culturally stunted or effeminate in some way. So here, both uh, gender and race were sort of thrown into the mix around discussions of this kind of architecture. 
the Edwardian Baroque was not just any kind of architecture or indeed any kind of classicism, but a gentlemanly Anglo-Saxon type of classicism. And that was important for these architects to, to uh, suggest to their audiences. Even where other national idioms were drawn upon, uh, be they French or Italian or German, it was the underlying composition, the so-called grand mannerism of British architecture that was seen to shine through. So again, it's this kind of thing that Blomfield, which I mentioned just earlier, just, just now, when he said that architecture, quote unquote, was something much greater, something beyond and outside of all those finicky things to do with design and detail, he's really talking about this kind of, these kind of underlying uh, sensibilities. <clears throat> now, just to give you a flavour of what he meant by that, I'll turn to a passage from a lecture by John McKean Bryden, another of the key advocates of the revival of Renaissance architecture as it was referred to at the time. Here's a quote from this lecture by Bryden. I think it's worth quoting in full because it really does capture, I think, the essence of what this architecture was seen to be about. So he says here, the 17th century was now drawing to a close. It had been a wonderful century. The country had made immense advances in all that makes for the greatness of a nation. It was no longer a question of England and Scotland, but of Great Britain. The East India Company had been incorporated and made great progress in the formation of what ultimately became our empire in the East. England's colonial empire had been founded by the settlements in the Carolinas and the New England states. The beginning of that greater Britain, which has come to be such a factor in the civilization of the world. In literature, we have the immortals Milton and Bunyan and Dryden. In science, the mighty Newton and Harvey and Flamstead, the founding of the Royal Society and the Royal Observatory. And everywhere, an enlarged and increased commerce. Through 60 years of it all, Wren worked away at his architecture. With the death of Wren, may be said to have closed the early English Renaissance, which had lasted about 100 years. It had now become firmly established as the national style, the vernacular of the country, such classic as this could never be found anywhere but in England. We must recognise that we are here in the presence of an English classical style as truly the embodiment of the civilization and the life of the people, a living, working architectural reality as much a part of England as its literature or its great school of painting, the nearest to us in time and in similitude of requirements. A great mind of artistic wealth open to all who have eyes to see, hearts to appreciate, and understanding to apply to the necessities of our day." End quote. So the second thing here is that Issues of identity were, as you can see, front and centre in the revival of English Renaissance architecture, or what we now call the Edwardian Baroque, and that the discourse around notions of race and culture and gender was in so many ways characteristic of its own self-perception. Importantly, this sat within and spoke to the wider new imperialist agenda of British commercial and political rejuvenation. No doubt the intentions of architects to express something about Britain's greatness and identity, commercially, culturally, and politically, was genuine enough, just that at the back of it, lurking in the psychic shadows, as it were, of the national conscience, everyone kind of knew that all was not well. The environment was threatening, the edifice fragile. This is, I think, what makes Edwardian Baroque architecture fascinating, actually. It is, as Blumfield had said, this something very much greater and beyond the art of architecture itself. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I think the architecture too um, uh, is, is interesting, even beautiful in some respects. I could talk a lot about the ins and outs of the architecture, 
Um, but I think it's the ideas behind uh, this kind of architecture that both or that make it both captivating and uh, topical, I think. So just to come back to the book. So in the book, I essentially trace this sort of underlying angst through various scenarios concerning the application of this architecture, both in Britain and its colonies. Um, you know, and, and sort of engaging with this idea, as the part of the book um, says, this idea of building a greater Britain, right? Uh, engaging themes such as governance, including political ideology, the constitution and rule of law, memory and memorialization, the economy, including uh, its imperial extension, and technological innovation encompassing communication and transportation. Infusing each, infusing each of these sort of categories is the ever-present leaven of social and cultural identity, nation and empire. So back to this idea of the preface of the book that I mentioned at the very beginning uh, of this talk and why this architecture may be seen to matter. Now, it's sometimes said that to draw parallels between different periods in history is folly. Despite whatever similarities there may appear to be, the fundamental contextual differences present too great an interpretive divide to bridge in any easy or meaningful way. The challenges thrown up by such a divide are, of course, greater the longer the two periods are separated in time. But it's a natural human instinct, I would suggest, to draw such parallels, as frivolous as they can sometimes be. They help us make sense, however tenuously, of our own times and to place events in the long view. Perhaps if nothing else, they encourage us not to repeat the mistakes of the past. Now, although clearly problematic historiographically, they can and often do serve all sorts of purposes from the personal to the political. In this sense, they have a certain rhetorical power. Moreover, in our current age of presentism and rampant identity politics, they are often marshaled in an effort to make history relevant. Now, when I set out to undertake this study, which is really quite some time ago, it's, it's, it's now bordering on 20 years or more, um, it was far from my intention to draw any kind of contemporary comparison let alone to make history relevant. And indeed, that's not really the purpose of the book uh, even now. But as research on the project unfolded and indeed accelerated in the years prior to publication, the wider geopolitical context changed before my very eyes, changed before all of our uh, eyes, so much so that it became almost impossible to ignore the many uncanny, uh, uncanny par parallels between the language that characterised debate during the late Victorian and Edwardian periods and that of our own time. This was especially the case with respect to the new imperialism and the contemporary political scene both in Britain and in the wider world. As I delve deeper into the primary sources and contemporary literature, what struck me was a form of speech predicated on a deep-seated anxiety, if not confusion, over Britain's place in the world. This included endless ruminations over what uh, its influence was and ought to be, and how best to achieve continued supremacy, whether it be economic, cultural, or both. The idea that Britain and the British uh, were a kind of unique breed with special qualities, including a genius for managing affairs and people, as well as facilitating trade, was prevalent. When one throws in the Irish home rule debate, the cultural theories concerning Anglo-Saxondom, especially the idea of kinship between Britain and the United States, 
then the language and strategies marshaled in aid of Brexit, for example, suddenly seemed, if not hackney, then at least well-worn. So as I listened to and read uh, debates and discussions in the media, day after day, month after month, over what Brexit meant and how it was going to transform the United Kingdom's fortunes, the echoes of a previous era really did reverberate persistently in my ears. The attempt by some to draw on historic Commonwealth connections as justification for Brexit, a kind of empire 2.0, as it was quickly parodied, was but one glaring example of this kind of thing. Now, um, I should say that as an Australian living in Scotland, I have to, uh, I have to say that I, I have no, or had no particular interest in Brexit, to be honest. Um, uh, as some might say, I had no uh, horse in that race or dog in that fight, as it were. Uh, either way, the result, for me at least, um, was the same. I didn't really see myself as British or European, let alone Scottish, despite my comparatively ancient Scottish ancestry. And uh, to this day, I still always do travel with my Australian passport. I don't have a British passport. So now being in the other queue uh, at airports, as so many complained about and bizarrely didn't expect somehow, is something I'm, I'm very well used to. So this afforded me, I think, a, a, a certain degree of, let's say, sentimental detachment, which in turn allowed me to be something of a sort of dispassionate observer. In other words, I could see and appreciate both sides of this argument, of this debate. But as I watched that debate unfold, following sometimes cringing at the various tactics put forward, I was reminded that in certain fundamental ways, British attitudes had not changed all that much in more than 100 years. It seemed to me that whether recalling Disraelian, Rosebarian, Churchillian, or later, dare I say it, Johnsonian notions of British pride and pluck, a distinct whiff of self-righteous swagger mingled with a perceptible, if not predictable, aroma of xenophobic suspicion has always fouled the air of British cultural and political debate. <clears throat> Which kind of, this image is from the early 20th century, but this kind of um, excitement uh, is something that kind of, I was kind of reminded of this kind of thing around the, the, the sort of fanfare and angst uh, regarding Brexit. To take one example. Now, as I mentioned, uh, among the biggest problems facing Edwardian Britons was the geopolitical tensions caused by great power rivalry. So, having lost its perch atop the summit of civilized industrial nations by the 1870s, Britain struggled, in fact, to recalibrate its relationship with the rising powers of an expanding Russia, a post Civil War United States and a newly unified Germany. The ultimate outcome of these tensions would be the devastation of the First World War. All the while, further east, an ambitious and belligerent Japan was fast increasing both its territory and its military capacity, threatening British interests in the Asia Pacific. Again, these events are not so different from the predicaments we face today only with a new constellation of great powers strutting across the world stage, this time played out in a contest between the Democratic Alliance of the United States, Europe, and their partners, including NATO, and the authoritarian axis of Russia, China, and Iran. How it will end this time, uh, nobody knows. But with nuclear weapons in abundance, the stakes could hardly be higher. Therefore, looking through the research material of this bygone era of the Edwardian time, times, I couldn't help but see something of the wider concerns embedded in these tensions 
reflected straight back at me. Just as colonials in places like Australia and New Zealand worried about Asian invasion, what was otherwise referred to at the time in shorthand as the yellow peril, today we hear about fears of Chinese and Russian neo-imperialism as resource security, ever-growing national pride, and paranoid geopolitical strategizing provide a pretext to financial coercion, media propaganda wars, political interference, and even full-scale invasion. All consequences, one might say, of this kind of new uh, era of post-truth that we sort of live in today. Now, I'm not saying that these threats aren't real, because they are. It's just that um, they have more than a kind of minor echo about them when looking back at the Edwardian uh, period. So now that Britain is alone in these choppy waters, with no empire to lean on and facing its own internal divisions, the dilemma seems heightened to me. Although geopolitical strategizing is characteristic, characteristic of most, um, if not all periods in history, one senses that tensions are now peaking in a way that if comparison were to be made, is perhaps more similar in some respects to the late Victorian and Edwardian periods than in any time since, including in the lead up to the Second World War and the subsequent Cold War. Enhanced by the penetrative and reverberant capacities of digital technology, and here I'm thinking of social media and the like, the diplomacy, quote unquote, of competitive moral virtue and military saber rattling is getting a new lease of life. Again, there is something unnervingly familiar about all of this, even if the, this, these specific circumstances are different. If this were not enough, the late Victorian and Edwardian periods also witnessed a race for the development of and control over communications technology, somewhat reminiscent of the contest over digital technologies we are currently experiencing. And this is one of the major um, themes that I tackle in, in the book. Now this concerned, of course, back then, telegraph technology uh, and the laying of submarine cable infrastructure in particular. By the 1880s, Britain had a sizable command over world communications uh, in this regard, but would go on to create, as you can see here, its own all red line spanning the globe, passing only through British controlled territory and protected waters in order to obtain a totally secure closed circuit. As tension between the great powers escalate, escalated, Anxiety over communication security likewise increased, reaching fever pitch by the end of the century, that is the end of the 19th uh, century. Once more, it is possible to see clear parallels here between national security interests and the installation of fifth generation of 5G telecommunications infrastructure in our own time. The similarity consists primarily of who owns installs, operates, and therefore regulates and potentially, potentially manipulates such technology. However, now it is China in the driving seat with the upper hand in terms of technology transfer, leaving Western democracies to ponder how to plug the apparent security deficit. Moreover, we hear of Russian submarines patrolling the North Sea, and there were reports of this only the other day um, again in an effort, among other things, to identify and map undersea telecommunications infrastructure in order to sabotage it in the event of conflict, just as um, the Royal Navy had done uh, with respect to German telecommunication cables in the early 20th century. So there's precedent for this. Now, this tension has taken on its own 21st century aspect via extension into space where future battles may be determined by who can knock out enemy satellite installations the fastest. Now, how any of this, if at all, feeds into current architectural discourse is yet to be determined. 
and is a question, I think, for a future generation of historians to consider. These days, uh, such, an such anxieties, it seems to me, uh, overridden and dominated by those concerning climate change, which has had a very palpable impact on architectural design, especially within the last decade and in schools of architecture, as the uh, climate emergency has been ramped up in our collective conscience. Other issues around contemporary identity politics, which again has resonances um, uh, with the past, only uh, with regard to different sets of registers, I think, uh, this time round. But what's clear, as my book demonstrates, is that such concerns did have an appreciable impact on architecture in the late Victorian and Edwardian periods. Indeed, it may be more accurate to say that architecture enjoyed something of a kind of co-productive relationship with such concerns. Or to put this another way, some of British architecture's theoretical ambitions were coterminous with concerns of this nature. Now, I'm not invoking these parallels as a means of justifying the study in any way, but merely to highlight the seemingly enduring power of architecture to speak to us through time in strange and unexpected ways. The architectural historian Siegfried Gideon once said that, and I quote, a backward look transforms its object and that history cannot therefore be touched without changing it, end quote. I think that's true. But sometimes the past reaches out and touches us by surprise, as if goading us to ponder afresh the dilemmas of our own age, providing something of a prism through which they are projected as a kind of morbid refraction. Many years have elapsed since this architectural phenomenon, that is the Edwardian Baroque, was studied in any serious or systematic way, when, as I mentioned earlier, Alistair Service produced his spate of publications on the topic in the 1970s. The conditions are now right for its reappraisal, both in part and in full. In this sense, Edwardian Baroque architecture reverberates with us in a different way now, I think, even from what it might have 10 years ago. Somehow it speaks to us again uh, in a way that our ears were not previously attuned or well-adjusted to hear, perhaps. It has a new kind of immediacy, I, I, I feel. Again, it's this, um, the sensing of these kind of strange historical parallels and resonances that makes Edwardian Baroque architecture a particularly rich and interesting subject of study. Long ignored uh, in the mainstream of architectural history, the Edwardian Baroque now has a new and somewhat irresistible claim upon our attention, it seems to me. Thank you. And thank Alex for this really, really rich talk and um, a lot of things to think about. And as you all are gathering all those thoughts and all those questions, I thought I would just kind of pick things off. Um, I've written down a lot of notes that probably don't make much sense to me anymore, but there were just a lot of things going through my head as you were speaking about all this. And I have heard you talk about, about this book before, but this was very different. And, and I really appreciated the, the different things that were coming out from this. Um, and I was really struck by, you talked about you know, the glories of world dominance, even though they were waning at that point when Eduard Eduardian broke, um, emerged and, and, um, and also you talked about, you know, that it signaled vigor and controlled assertiveness and gentlemanly classicism, but also it, you know, it's, it's showing insecurity perhaps. And I found that very interesting that, um, this idea of the Baroque, at least by the, you know, the mid 18th century is considered excessive the excesses of the Baroque and the kind of um you know fantastical you know it's pushing pushing the boundaries of what is appropriate and then to uh, at the 
turn of the 20th century to consider that those excesses as a positive. Um, and I'm not really sure what my question is going on this, but this idea that something that had been seen as a negative now, when we're trying to show that our empire is doing really well and everything's great, is to harness something that had been considered a negative and now saying, look at the excess we have and the cornucopia and the um, and I'm curious at what stage in your research on this did that connection of insecurity and let's project something kind of come out? Uh, well, it's interesting, isn't it, how <clears throat> styles, periods, movements of architecture have no fixed meaning and the, the, the histories can, in fact, be rewritten and are often rewritten according to the needs of a given society. Um, so that quote I gave you from John Bryden is an attempt to extract something out of the original Baroque and reframe it and put it in this uh, political context um, as well. So that's one thing. These these architects, these, um, I won't say theorists, there were some some of them like Bloomfield and Bryden and others who wrote about this architecture, tried to explain what it was all about. Um, so they, I think that for them, the Baroque was something which um, <clears throat> connected to a certain kind of English identity. So someone like Herbert Baker, for instance, talked a lot about this, how you saw Wren as this um, great English gentlemanly kind of architect, uh, someone who, although his architecture had sort of Baroque flourishes, was undergirdled with a certain kind of rational, sober, sensible geometry. The, all these characteristics of the architecture somehow mapped onto um, character traits of, of, of the Englishmen and British people, right? So they're trying to um, uh, map and devise these symmetries. Um, mm -hmm. So um, whilst all the time in the background, it was quite clear that um, Britain uh, was, its world status was under threat, and I think everyone knew this. This is why I say that architects um, don't live and exist in a sort of vacuum. <laughs> people like all of us, they read the newspapers, they understand what's going on, so all this stuff is percolating through their minds and is coming out in various ways through this architecture. So I gave that one quote, but there are dozens and dozens of them like that, which again speak to these kind of anxieties, I think, about what British architecture should be. Because um, this was also at a time where architects like the Brydons, like the Blomfields and Aston Webbs and so on, felt that British architecture had lost its way. So by the time you get to the 1880s, they're thinking, well, what is British architecture? What's it doing? It seems to be um, eclectic beyond recognition. It needs to get a grip and start to form a coherent image of what yeah. Britain and its architecture should be. I think that's what really sort of under, underlies all of this. It's about identity, I think, in many but I also love the idea of getting a grip is always is is interpreted so differently at different points in time. You know, in the early 20th or the late 19th century, that's interpreted one way, and in the 18th or 19th century, completely different way of getting a grip and reacting against what has been going on. Um I have plenty more questions, but does anybody else want to jump in at this point? Yeah. Yes, time for the Excellent lecture, and I just kind of want to jump off from Rebecca there and continue this question about the Baroque, mm. because as you showed with that incredible little kind of quote from the builder, Wren was framed as a Renaissance architect, as a classicist, and the Baroque during this period was sort of term of abuse, um, you know, for highly theatrical, sense-orientated Southern European architecture of Spain and Italy. It's not really until Sackville sit well with Southern Baroque art, you know, sort of begins to reclaim this style. So I'm sort of curious, one, who, term, who coins the term Edwardian Baroque? And two, what kind of explanatory power does this have 
name, this identification givers that calling it Edwardian classicism, for instance, doesn't. Um, yes, that's interesting. So uh, what I should say to start with is that this term Edwardian Baroque is a modern art history term. It wasn't used by the architects at the time. They referred to this architecture as English Renaissance or Renaissance Revival. So they saw the likes of well, people from Inigo Jones onwards through the middle of the 18th century as Renaissance architects. Um, so that's how they saw it. And, of course, they did actually write a bit about um, European architects of the what became known as the Baroque period, the Beninis of this world and so on, um, <clears throat> and Borromini's, and they spoke about them in sort of derogatory terms. As I used the term in the lecture, effeminate, they described these architects and their architecture as effeminate in some way, therefore un-English, unmanly, unmasculine, et cetera, et cetera. Where does it come in? When does the Edwardian Brock as a term appear? Well, that's later in the 1930s and 40s, um, when professional art history starts to um, uh, sort of take off in Britain, when you had German scholars especially coming over to Britain in the 30s. Um, people like Vitkova, who um, were studying the Baroque, and other English historians picked up on these Baroque studies and said, well, hey, we've got actually our own Baroque, quote unquote, architects, really, the, the Wrens and the Hawksmoors and Vambras and so on. So let's call them um, English Baroque. Um, and then by the time we get to the 60s and 70s, there are books being written, uh, studies being undertaken on, in, quote unquote, English Baroque architects. So the terminology had changed quite a bit by then. And so this guy, Alistair Service, who I, I mentioned, who wrote about this architecture in the 1970s, he basically made the term Edwardian Baroque popular. Others had kind of mentioned, Pevsner had mentioned English, um, um, what do you call it, I think English uh, 19th century Baroque, all these, 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 these terms are floating around, but service really solidified this term Edwardian Baroque, and I think it's what's well, been used ever since. I did think, I did contemplate briefly whether I should jettison this term for something different, but I thought actually it does, it has a certain efficacy, right, and it makes sense, um, and it it's also connects it directly back to um, the, as it were, original Baroque period of centuries previous. Thank you. Again, lots of thoughts uh, percolating, but I, I wanted, to, I was thinking about um, contested heritage and particularly debates around sculpture and public monuments and statuary often sit outside buildings such as you know, government, um, government buildings, etc. And, and that's obviously been a topic of great debate um, across the world and, and particularly in the last few years. But I was wondering whether architecture has been in the same cross currents. And you showed the um, image of um, the building in Pretoria and that these, these buildings still often operate as seats of power and government and, and, and um, yeah, part of kind of daily contemporary life and don't seem to have been caught in the same kind of, let's just use the culture wars yeah. terminology yeah. for ease. Yeah. And so what, why is it that, um, this, which is a you know a contested heritage, like you say, it's about mm -hmm. identity and global politics. Why why is it, or or is it that architecture is immune, and yet sculpture, perhaps maybe because of its representational qualities, ha sort of is bearing the focus of of um, of, of those debates. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting thing to ponder. I mean. I think my instinct is to, is to say that it's mostly a practical matter. Buildings are much harder to deal with than statues or paintings and things like that. Um, they, a lot of these buildings I showed on the screen still exist and still being used in various ways in the countries that they exist in. Um, they've been repurposed uh, in various ways, but they still exist. 
And I've heard of no attempt to knock them down or to, you know, sort of um, refurbish them beyond recognition, anything like that. Yeah. I think that people just accept that perhaps is, there is this idea that buildings have no, like I said before in my answer to Rebecca's question, they have no fixed meaning, right? They Their purposes and meanings can change with the people who use and occupy them. And a classic example of that would be <clears throat> New Delhi. Has there ever been a greater symbol of British imperial power than that urban setting? I don't think so. Yet it wasn't demolished. It was simply taken over and repurposed and became the infrastructure for the new independent Indian state. Sure, some of the symbols that were, were easily movable were taken away like statues of royalty and so on, but the buildings remained... And they were absolutely, they actually are magnificent buildings. They kept and simply repurposed and became part of a new story, a new narrative about um, the new Indian nation going forward. So I think buildings are more difficult to deal with on the one hand, but also they offer this ability for repurposing <clears throat> that perhaps it's more difficult for statues. I mean, statues and paintings can be. I mean, my view is you don't have to tear them down. You can you can explain and you can put some. I'm of, I'm of the school of um, <clears throat> retain and explain, right? so you can do certain things with them without having to destroy them. But buildings are, are of another order, I think, um, which is difficult to, to deal with. So I know we have some questions coming in online, but I I wanted to jump on that in terms of structurally. I imagine that Edwardian Baroque architecture is quite different from early, you know, 18th century architecture. I'm guessing there's iron involved and things like that. How does that work in terms of conservation? Do these buildings stand up the same way? Um, how, yeah, are there issues of of different cores to them? Um, I think, I mean, the one, all the ones I've shown here were pretty well built. I mean, all the, I've been to see all of these buildings and they have held up extremely well. They mm. will well put together. Um, they were there was use of modern materials, so steel, frame, concrete, and so on. So that was like they look, um, as it were, historic on the exterior. They were quite modern structures mm -hmm. and had lots of modern technology in them. And this is one of the um, the sort of means by which the architects celebrated them was to say that these are great modern buildings. Um, what's interesting is that around the same time, the early 20th century, we started to see the beginnings of, of modernism with a capital M as a style. Um, <clears throat> but these buildings were as modern, technically speaking, as many of those modern buildings were aesthetically. Right? Mm -hmm. So they, and, we, and if, you, if you go to Whitehall now, you'll, you'll, you'll have seen that the old war office has just been completely renovated and turned into a five-star hotel. And um, they didn't have to rebuild it. it, it they basically just um, uh, refurbished the interior and exterior and just gave the exterior a bit of a facelift. But it's, 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 from what I understand, it didn't have any major structural issues that needed to be dealt with. Just curious. Um, we had a question, we have a question online from Wilson Yao, um, who asks, what were the circumstances or patterns of Edwardian Baroque being willingly embraced by or forced upon the white colonies and the rest of the British Empire? Um, well, uh, I wouldn't say that it was forced on them because what was happening at this time is that there was a lot of movement of architects and architectural expertise around the British world. Architects as well as other professionals were quite mobile. Um, so some of these buildings I showed here were in fact designed by British architects who had immigrated to Australia or New Zealand or wherever it may be, Canada. Um, and began working either in departments of public works or setting up private practice. And because they were trained in Britain, they, they took those ideas with them, the most contemporary um, fashionable ideas and architecture with them to these places. 
And of course, these governments wanted modern up-to-date buildings. So if you look at the what's written in the press about these buildings when they're being designed and built, they often hinge on this idea of um, are we getting a good and modern up-to-date building as we might expect that home quote unquote in Britain. So they're concerned about they weren't getting second rate buildings, which is why they were keen to employ these British architects with the latest knowledge. But, but of course, you also have to remember that there was um, a, a sort of ecology of lit professional uh, literature at this time that was circulating around the British Empire. So with, you know, the trade journals, with the um, professional journals and so on, ideas were moving quite easily and freely between Britain and the colonies. Um, so although some of these ideas may have taken a few years to catch on, eventually they did. And so those buildings I showed in Durban, for instance, or Brisbane or New Zealand were pretty much contemporary with, with these buildings in Britain. Yes, Neil Jackson. Well, thank you, Alex. That really was very interesting and such a nicely presented visual um, sequence of images. I've been trying to arrange my thoughts, and I don't know if I can really come up with a question, but it's maybe more of an observation, which I would try to, I try to end with a question mark. You um, were well, looking at the pictures. I think you were suggesting that this type of architecture started in the 1880s. I can't now remember what that particular building was, 1888 or something. Um, and it was in 1882 that the law courts on the Strand in London were finally opened, which of course is a, a building in the Gothic tradition. And thinking back over 19th century architecture, there are very, very few buildings in England which I would say were successful and which were in the big, big public buildings, I should say, which were successful and in the, the Gothic style. The Houses of Parliament are the biggest, but that, as Pugin remarked, was just Tudor details on a classical body, so we can exclude that. But beyond that, there's very, very few. And when they did, in the later part of the century, the third quarter or so, start to move into um, big public buildings, they tended to veer slightly off a pure Gothic line, such as at the Natural History Museum, and adopt something more Romanesque. Mm -hmm or um, 15, 20 years later, I'm thinking now of the um, Roman Catholic Cathedral by Bentley, which again is Byzantine. Mm -hmm. And my, my feeling is that it's very much the, um, the revival of the Anglican Church and the, um, the opportunity for Roman Catholic churches to be built, which really drove mid 19th century architecture as a, in terms of architectural expression or so as a sort of ecclesi ecclesiological vehicle. And here I'm pushing aside all those nonconformist buildings, which um, were very much in the um, classical style. But with the buildings you're showing, we're, we're changing gear and we're not looking at um, ecclesiastical buildings, we're looking at public buildings, we're looking at town halls and libraries and art galleries and. Um, railway stations and all that sort of stuff. And it, it seems to me that once religion, in a sense, had been satisfied through architecture, then the architects or public or financiers, whoever, um, the government, turned to something else. And this is um, a consolidation of what is British, perhaps, through this um, remarkable collection of, of very large and very fine buildings. That's not really a question, it's a sort of a thought about what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, but would you agree with this, that 19th century was driven by ecclesiastical architecture and the interest in ecclesiology and uh, the Anglican revival and all that, and by 1880, we have this sort of tremulous area, which is described now as Queen Anne revival, which is neither one thing nor the other, mm -hmm. but quite pretty. Mm -hmm. And then there's a... a a move into gear once more with people like Thomas Graham Jackson and the examination schools in Oxford. And we start to, and the, you know, these are people trained in the Gothic tradition. And we start now to see these great um, 
classical monuments coming out? I, mean, I think there's a question in there at the end. Yeah, I, mean, I think, I mean, you know, I think it's true to say that particularly through the middle decades of the 19th century, yeah. Gothic was um, in the ascendancy for sure. And that was mainly, as you say, through the ecclesiological revival, which was very, the very powerful uh, I think emotional as well as intellectual, intellectual impact on a generation of British architects like George Edmund Streets and Butterfield and these kind of people. Um, and, the, and, and a bit later, Alfred Waterhouse. And this filtered through into his secular buildings as well. So um, uh, if we were to point to some grand public buildings in the Gothic style, we might point to, in fact, regional or provincial town halls, which did more of that kind of thing than uh, in the metropolis itself. Um, but these things kind of ebb and flow. So by the time you get to the 1870s and 80s, um, the Gothic Revival is still there. It's still being used for ecclesiastical buildings, but um, its star is beginning to wane a bit. And the reputation of Britain's classical architects begins to start rising again. We have this so-called cult of Wren coming up through the 1880s and 90s, and suddenly uh, the younger generation of architects at that point um, became interested in that heritage, that tradition, as opposed to the Gothic. But at the same time, they tried to peg it to indigenous um, origins, right? Just like the Gothic in the mid-19th mid century tried to ground itself in indigenous, um, in a kind of indigenous mythology, um, so too with these architects, but with classical architecture, which is really a foreign import. But as you saw from that quote by... Bryden, he would claim that in the hands of these great Renaissance masters, it had been vernacularized and become a British form of classicism. So in both these cases, I, I think, again, identity is at play there somewhere and they kind of ebb and flow. So, so at this point in time, it's the tendency, I think, especially with big public buildings. Um, that's my sense anyway. Okay, thanks for your talk. Um, yeah, my question sort of um, is linked to the last one, actually. Um, I think the when we're talking about the concept of Baroque is quite a, as I say, quite a paradoxical one because, um, you know, Ren was drawing on these, um, like, I would say French, mainly French influences at the time, and um, a few decades later, there would be a whole shift towards Palladianism and call for, like, a more clean classicism in, uh, in Britain. And... I think when we're talking about this period, um, what struck me when reading about it is that a lot of um, architects, when they um, they all had overwhelming sort of art, art and craft and um, Gothic training, but they were practicing classicism um, later in their careers. And I was just wondering, were there sort of like a, did you come across any sort of debate about what Englishness actually is in this period? Um, because you have one hand, you know, um, when Gothic Revival was um, the sort of official style in the Victorian period, people were also calling it very English, you know, looking at sort of medieval Gothic architecture, of course. Um, and were there sort of an attempt to m combine vernacular architecture with the classicism in this period? Did you come across any examples of that? Um, well, there's two parts to that. The first is... Um this issue of what's an Englishman, right? Um, which again is not a fixed um, uh, concept. So it's different in the mid 19th century to the latter part of an Edwardian period. I mean, lots of people were talking in various other contexts about what constituted English, Englishness, but in terms of architecture itself within that domain, there were certain architects which would go on about this. The classic example would be Herbert Baker. He was always going on about what's an Englishman, what's an English architecture, how do these two things intersect and overlap with each other, how can we identify an English architecture based on certain cultural yeah. traits and characteristics. Um, he wrote a few essays on this kind of thing. Uh, so people were definitely thinking about it. Um, uh, he would point to things like some of the terms I used here like us that um 
uh, English, so-called English Baroque was of a different order to continental Baroque. He would say it was more staid, more sober, more rational, et cetera, et cetera. And these were considered to be also coincidentally, <laughs> not surprisingly, um, character traits of, of, you know, the, the good old Englishmen, so to speak. Um, so they were trying to do that kind of thing. Arts and crafts, well, yes, it's true to say some of these, I mean, Baker, again, is a classic example of this. Someone who was enamored of the arts and crafts, someone who was, who was trained, in that, trained in that that tradition, someone who designed many houses in South Africa that are uh, arts and crafts and really fine specimens of arts and crafts and architecture, yet went on to design something like the Union Buildings in Pretoria. Um, and I think both in uh, that building and in the Bank of England building, there are there are inklings of a certain arts and crafts sensibility which creep into it at certain points through the use of materials in certain ways. It's a bit more suppressed, obviously, because the, the grand matter of, of the classicism must speak, come through and speak the loudest. But there in the details and some of the interior decor, the arts and crafts is still prevalent. So there is something of a overlap between these things. And again, Baker would say that the arts and crafts is also a kind of English tradition which he wanted to incorporate into his architecture. Yeah, I just think that's interesting, the idea of whether there, I assume there are parallels throughout history of how you describe a proper English gentleman or an Englishman and proper architecture. I imagine there are probably a lot of the same words are used for both. Um, anyone else with a thought? Neil, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I don't want to dominate, but it occurs to me, um, if we're talking about the architecture of empire, which I think you're doing, mm. that buildings just like this existed in their scores, um, if not their hundreds, in Japan in the early mm. part of the 20th century um, during the Meiji um, era up to 1912 and the Taisho era, era after that. And it, it was very much this sort of architecture that uh, Japan was using to demonstrate its westernization <clears throat> and also to um, show its its power and wealth when it started to create its empire. So we get them across the Japanese islands and also in what is now Korea and bits of China. So this was seen as an architecture of um, empire by other empires. Yeah, I think that's very interesting, but especially the Japanese example, because of course, at this point in time, Japan was also, as you say, its own um, empire of the rising sun, and <clears throat> we know where that led, but um, they were keen to um, <clears throat> show how they were going through processes of mod modernization. And it's interesting they settled on this kind of architecture or architecture like it. Uh, to express that um, uh, that movement, I, I think there's. I'm, I'm sure, I know there's people. People have written on on that kind of architecture in Japan um, and around that guy. Is it Joseph, Joseph Konda? Or is that his name? The guy who was one of the leading educators and practitioners of young Japanese architects in this kind of architecture. But it would be interesting to see or to try and understand how um, how these young architects were looking back to Britain in particular and to a certain kind of architecture or to emulate a certain kind of architecture in the context of these um, uh, political and economic um, happenings. So I don't I'm not I'm not sure I've come across any scholarship which looks at, the relationship between these two things, only work that kind of talks about those buildings uh, in the context of Japan or say in Shanghai or wherever else they may be. Um, drawing the dots a bit further afield would be, I think, a really useful exercise, actually. 
So I'm realizing that we have, we've been talking for quite a while. Um, and I know that our online audience, unfortunately cannot join us for the next stage of this evening. Um, but, uh, for those of you who are here, we can continue this conversation in the ante room, um, next door where there are drinks. Um, but, uh, before we do that, I would like, I would hope everyone would join me in, um, thanking professor Alex Brumner again for this really, you know, inspiring, um, reflection on this period of architectural history.